Every day, something dramatic happens in the Caribbean that affects our lives. We'll give you the details. We'll give you the facts on Caribbean Perspective with Eddie Fedrick. How's Eddie Fedrick? So glad you can join us. Trinidad and Tobago police descend on drug susu and seize receipts and cash again. This story takes the lead in our 974th edition of Caribbean Perspective for Thursday, 29th October 2020. Details after this important message. The hurricane season is now upon us, so we as Caribbean people need to remember to think safety and be prepared. Avoid venturing outside during a storm or hurricane, especially if there are strong winds. Rooftops and other debris are often blown about and can cause great damage. Welcome back. Officers of the Professional Standards Bureau of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service returned to the headquarters of the now infamous Drug Susu Pyramid Scheme and executed a search warrant seizing receipts and cash once more, prompting people who would have been patiently waiting for their payout to complain about the police-led operation, which to them seems to be hampering their desire for a better life. TV6's Nicholas Lutchman Singh has this story. A little over a month ago, September 21st to be exact, police officers raided the location what is now known as Drug Susu at Phase 1 La Hokita, taking several persons into custody and seizing some $22 million in cash without authorization from the police commission. The money was returned to the DSS founder, Karen Clark, by police officers from the La Hokita station. This has since sparked several investigations, resulting in four senior police officers being suspended and other junior officers transferred. Today being the second raid, one investor in the so-called drug susu speaking on behalf of those like him said in exasperation that they have simply had enough, as they believe that drugs susu is by the poor and for the poor. Well, it's a poor people development, right? Black people thing. That they, they're trying to encourage black people to have something in the future, right? And everybody supporting this business right around Trinidad and Tobago. And I don't see no reason why that they should stop this business. Walters, who hails from Toko, says being a simple farmer trying to make ends meet led him to invest his money against the backdrop of the current difficult economic scenario. And what he said was the ease of doing business at the DSS which he found to be very attractive. We're putting your money in the bank. We're begging for loans. We can't get it. We can't do no business with the banks. The banks need a whole heap of things that you mightn't have. You, you, you never read your requirements to get a loan. Everything I do in the bank to get a loan, I can't get it. And here, you put in 5000 you get 30000 in 20 days. Right? It's, it's one of the best investments that black people, black person could do right now in Trinidad. He says persons like him have not yet encountered a problem in getting the promised returns on their investment. For the past couple months, people have been investing their money in this business and nobody had a problem with collecting their hand. Everybody had confidence in this business because it was getting paid and everybody started investing more and more in this business. I, I, I don't understand why that they having a problem with this gentleman who running this business because he's not doing nothing wrong to the nation. Walters argues if the director of DSS was committing a crime, they would have arrested him already and not just seize poor people's money. No reason why these people are the commenting. And they have the police looking bad, taking we money. Well, if you're doing wrongdoing, yes. But so far, we ha they, they, they're taking the money and they're not arresting the man. So something wrong. Walters and others gathered at the DSS location believe that the police raids are motivated by the desire to keep poor people poor, as this scheme is too good to be true. The 1% have gone on TV and boast that they are the 1% in Trinidad and more powerful than the, 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 the 99%. We now getting a chance to gain something out of our own business. We need help. Black people need help in this country and nobody to help them. This one black man come up with a great idea. And now they find it too good for we. Nicholas Hutchman Singh, 
TV6 News. Over in Guyana, GCOM votes in favor of appointing an attorney to the Chief Election Officer Keith Lowenfield to represent the election body during the hearing and trial of the election petitions filed by the APNU AFC. Aubrey Norton says this is wrong and the CEO has a right to his own attorney. PPP Commissioner Manoj Narayan says the decision is based on the Constitution. The details in this report from Wendell Badry of HGP Nightly News. Executive member of the PNCR, Aubrey Norton, during a virtual press conference on Friday, stated that he has been reliably informed that some PPP commissioners at the GCOM meeting voted in favor of having an attorney assigned by the commission to the chief election officer, Keith Lowenfield, while he is expected to make appearances on behalf of the commission in the trial of the two election petitions filed by the coalition party. That they went to the elections commission and the PPP and the chairman voted in total contravention of the law that they must give to the chief elections officer an attorney. That is like charging Caesar to be tried by Caesar. This, the executive member stated, is a tactic being used by the current regime to frustrate and infringe on the outcome of the election petitions, since it can only be assumed that this decision may very well result in the appointment of a PPP-aligned attorney. When questioned further by this newscast, Norton mentioned that the decision by the commission is wrong and that the CEO is entitled to his own attorney. The chief election officer has, is entitled to choose it, his own lawyer because we know if the PPP chooses a lawyer for him and when you say a majority decision in the Elections Commission, which is the PPP commissioners and the chairman, you're virtually saying the PPP will decide. Meanwhile, during a conversation with this newscast, attorney at law, Manoj Narayan, who represents the PPP on the commission, confessed to moving the motion at the level of the commission to have an attorney represent the CEO. That is correct, but the basis of that decision is as a result of the provisions as contained in Section 4.2 of the National Assembly Validity of Elections Act. Narayan went on to explain what the Act says. So in essence, what that Act, that section says, is that in an elections petition, the Commission is represented through the office of the CEO, which of course is a statutory office. And as a result of the basis of that provision, a uh, motion was moved. I moved a motion at the level of the commission that the commission should be the one to appoint an attorney at law to represent its interests in the elections petition through the CEO. And that motion was moved. It was uh, passed. The chairperson voted in favor of it. While the commissioner stated that no attorney has yet been decided on, he said that he has made a submission to the commission for an attorney at law Anthony Astefan of Dominica, whom he mentioned to be one of the leading attorneys in the Caribbean on election matters, including petitions, and that Astefan has no connection to politics in Guyana, nor is he certain whether he has been admitted to the bar of these shores. Wendell Badri reporting for the HGP Nightly News. You're listening to Caribbean Perspective with Eddie Frederick. Over in St. Lucia, cops seize guns, drugs, and charge a Jamaican for illegal entry into St. Lucia. Solange Alfred of HTS News Force reports. Illegal firearms continue to pour into St. Lucia, a factor in the gun-related homicides and offenses that have beset the island for over two decades. The Royal St. Lucia Police Force continues its efforts at ridding the streets of unlicensed firearms, that often fall into the hands of trigger-happy criminals who have demonstrated no compunction, inflicting physical harm on their targets, leaving unsuspecting civilians mourning the loss of loved ones. Superintendent of Police with Responsibility for Crime Management, George Nicholas, on Monday, divulged details of an operation conducted on Thursday, October 22nd, that yielded positive results in the seizure of more illicit firearms. Denny police conducted searches in the Denny area, during which time Lester Eugene, better known as Circle of La Pointe Denry, 
Also, Lencia Sergis of Denny River Denry were both arrested with um, unlicensed firearm and ammunition. Charges were preferred against the two individuals for the possession of unlicensed firearm and ammunition. Bail was set in the sum of $10,000 each on the charge of the unlicensed firearm and $5,000 on the charge of possession of unlicensed um, ammunition. According to Nicholas, another operation conducted in Denry resulted in the seizure of 54 kilograms of cannabis. Information reaching me that the, the police conducted an operation where um, some drugs were recovered in, in Denry and some persons were taken into custody. Um, no charges has been laid thus far, so I'm not in a position to um, reveal the names of the individuals who were taken into custody. Moreover, the fight against backdoor entrance has been an arduous task for law enforcement, which has expended both manpower and resources to patrol the high seas. Nicholas disclosed that 43-year-old Jamaican national Grantville Blake was arrested for coming into the island at an unauthorized point of entry. Nicholas says Blake has completed his stint in quarantine and will soon have his bail conditions set. He would have been um, in quarantine for some time, and upon his release from quarantine, he was he was charged. A bail hearing is scheduled for later today. Commissioner of Police Severin Morsheri at a wide-ranging press briefing last week announced that the RSLPF would be taking a tougher stance in the fight against crime island-wide. Solaj Alfred, HTS News Force. The cash-strapped regional airline Liat, which is hoping to return to the skies on November 1st, has informed retrenched workers that payment of any indebtedness would not be made at this time, even as it sent letters of dismissals to several staff members, including pilots, flight attendants and engineers. The court-appointed administrator Cleveland Seaforth, in a letter sent to a shipping clerk with the airline, noted that the position had been made redundant. Further to a correspondent to you with respect to your temporary layoff, we now write to you advising of the administration's decision that effective November 20th, 2020, your employment with Liat 1974 Limited has been made redundant according to the letter, which was read out on the Observer Radio in Antigua on Friday. Seaforth reminded the workers that the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic has caused a major downturn in the economy and has had a detrimental impact on the airline, which is now in the process of being recapitalized and owing in excess of $100 million to its creditors. He said that while Leah recognizes its financial obligations to the retrenched workers, all applicable entitlements will be discussed with the relevant bargaining trade union for resolution and finalization prior to the workers being notified of the amount due to them. But he said that in light of the company's current financial state, the payment of any indebtedness cannot be made at this time and is dependent on the outcome of the court supervisory restructuring process. The Antigua and Barbuda government announced earlier this week that the airline, whose major shareholders had included Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Dominica, will return to the skies on November 1st. Earlier this month, Prime Minister Gaston Brown said that his administration is prepared to collapse the regional airline if it does not emerge as a new and lean entity as part of the reorganizational plans. Prior to its collapse, Liat flew to 21 destinations, operating an average of 112 daily flights within a complex network, combining profitable and uneconomic routes. Airline observers said that these 39 unprofitable flights were to 18 territories. I am Eddie Frederick. This has been Caribbean Perspective, a whole new approach to highlighting developments in the Caribbean. In the meantime, please continue to log on to CaribbeanPerspective.com for more daily news and more.